I'm gonna I'm gonna be I'm gonna be honest with you. Sard is a cope, and Spinoza is right. <laughs> oh right. shit! Okay, okay. I um, love this kind of clarity. Like let's <laughs> let's hear the gambit. <laughs> yeah, I I I've got to say I'm I'm out. Like y'all take it. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Will. I defended my dissertation on Friday. In the last 48 hours, I have lost my voice. I am sorry. Yay. Uh, yay. Congratulations. Yay. Congrats. Ooh. Congrats, doctor. Uh, Lovely introduction. Yeah. Well, and for today's show, we're very excited to be joined by a special guest, uh, Aaron Rabinowitz of Embrace the Void. Hey, Aaron. Uh, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, thank you so much. I really love this show from the beginning, and I'm excited to be feel. I feel very lucky to vibe with your community here. Hell yeah, thank you. We got luck and vibes. Those are, yeah, you, those are you, the two you were a, you were a day on one enthusiast, <laughs> and I feel like we owe you a big thank you for that. By the way, yeah, yeah. I I was in from the beginning. I, yeah. I love uh, the the guilty pleasure of feeling like I'm sitting in and on on the usual shit talking in a grad, um, <laughs> you know, totally session. Well, you get today to graduate from parasociality to actually being part of the discussion. So this is cool. There you go. Let's go. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. It only took having three quarters of y'all on ETV. Yeah, exactly. but, yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> it's so worth wow. it. Wow. <laughs> I love that. I love that slam. Like, only took me trying to drag you all on my pod to get me on here. But okay, <laughs> reciprocity. Mm, yeah, yeah. You know. So right. Aaron is, in addition to a podcast host, Embrace the Void, and Philosophers in Space, uh, is a PhD candidate in education at Rutgers University. Uh, I'm actually hoping we can talk a little bit about why your your show is called Embrace the Void. What you mean by void? Or when you talk about things as being voidy, because I think it actually it's related to some of the sort of mm -hmm. fundamental philosophical commitments that are going to be up for discussion today. Uh, mm -hmm. So we've looked at a paper that you wrote on free will belief and disbelief and pedagogical methodology. And also, at least some of us have taken a look at a classic paper by Thomas Nagel on moral luck. So I'm going to want to hear you lay out the ideas yourself, because I think it's super interesting what you're arguing in the paper. But if I can set the scene a little bit. Uh, my basic understanding is that you're a fairly strict determinist about free will, uh, which doesn't mm -hmm. bother me as a Spinozist, but uh, yeah, it's kind of a hard sell for a lot of Team people. Team Spinoza, what, what? Yeah, what? <laughs> uh, but from your determinist perspective, you think that luck is an important, at least psychological category to come to terms with. Uh, so people tend to make sense of their situations, uh, the decisions apparently available to them, the choices they actually make. And maybe most significantly, the moral character of their actions in terms that are very much not fully in their control and which therefore involves some degree of chance or luck. So I didn't, for instance, have any control over the circumstances of my birth, the people I grew up with, you know, what I was exposed to at university, my teachers and so on. Uh, and yet here I am seemingly making decisions for which I am in some way morally responsible, right? Like I'm very lucky, but what does that mean exactly? And how does that sort of contingency interact with the conception of moral responsibility that I employ when I hold myself to have done the right thing or acted inappropriately and, you know, mostly inappropriately? Um, <laughs> now, True. They, mm -hmm. <laughs> we Can all vouch. know, right? We don't have to. Can get vouch. Yeah. You know. So Nagel draws, Nagel draws specific attention to the apparent full incompatibility with this sort of chancy, contingent character of the context of decision-making and how sensitive we actually are in theory and in practice to that sort of contextual, chancy, out-of-control character. Between that and like the sort of Kantian classic conception of morality, uh, which considers only the intentions of one's will, explicitly divorced from things like consequences and empirical reality. So we can be blunt about this, right? For the Kantian, morality is all about necessity, but we just do live in a contingent world, and it's not actually clear how these two could ever meet, right, in practice. 
right? So what survives mm -hmm. of this conception of morality and responsibility when we recognize that we're almost always determined from without by circumstances beyond our control? This has implications for lots of important issues that I think we uh, on this show are really interested in, you know, for instance, uh, theories of punitive or retributive justice, right? So what mm -hmm. sense does it make to hold people responsible for what ultimately are accidents of fate? You know, what remains of responsibility in a chancy, faded world? And what are we to make of this mismatch between our everyday intuitions about responsibility and these sort of clean theoretical commitments about what morality is supposed to be like? Now, you are specifically, I think, most interested in asking about whether pedagogically speaking, we're better served by buying into free will as, a, as an illusion in a kind of like platonic noble lie, or if it wouldn't be wiser mm -hmm. and maybe more practically efficacious to talk to students as people who may or may not be relatively lucky in their particular determination. Now, there's like a lot of empirical mm -hmm. cognitive scientific data that you work through that's relevant here. Of course, I'm more interested in the sort of philosophical underpinnings of your view. Uh, so maybe the place to start is by asking you sort of directly what you understand by luck, uh, what's going on with this paradoxical idea of moral luck, you know, what these notions mean for our conception of moral assessment and what you mean by a pedagogy of luck. Yeah, great. That's a, that's a lot of good things. And I really appreciate the way you laid that out there. I think that that very well conveys sort of mostly what my project is about here. So I'll, I'll start with like the headlines that are, you know, potentially going to upset a lot of people. Um, and then, you know, we can work our way through how, how I got there, essentially. Um, but the headlines are, a, as you say, I am, I'm a determinist. Um, I think that free will is an illusion. I think that it's an illusion that we can disabuse ourselves of in particular. And I think that we ought to disabuse ourselves of it by doing various kinds of pedagogical work to um, help people unlearn sort of both, I think, cultural and evolutionary forces that are uh, driving us towards that illusion. Um, so what this means is there's no free will. What I like to often say is, well, let me put it this way. Um, probably everybody on this call thinks that like your life is at least 80% luck, maybe 70%, somewhere probably above 50% because you're on the left, right? <laughs> the, sort of no, the we're, first... we're that melancholic left. Are you, are you kidding? <laughs> yeah, yes, 100% right, right. yeah. luck. We just Good, crossing right. our fingers. <laughs> right. So, you know, the first step for me in this process is basically getting people from the point of thinking that their life is mostly luck to recognizing that it's all luck. It's luck all the way down, okay? that's And that can be an existentially terrifying step for a lot of people, including people on the left. Um, so we can talk through how, you know, how I got there and how I try to help other people get there. Um, but I think that's the, that's the important psychological step that individuals need to make and at a societal level that we need to make for readjusting, as you say, various uh, implications. Now, what does this mean for morality and moral responsibility? Folks who have listened to me will know I am a extra weird, you know, moral realist, objectivist. I think there are objective moral truths that are stance independent. So now I'm now I'm going to upset the other half of your audience, right? Yeah, you really, this, <laughs> this alienates almost everyone. This rocks. Yeah, let's, oh, let's, I, let's I go. Be, I'm here to piss off absolutely everybody. <laughs> this is going to be our least popular episode ever. <laughs> yeah, no, I want to be as many people's joker moment as possible. That is my goal in life. Fantastic. Um, we'll send yeah, you the so download total when, when, we, when we get it next week. Yeah, yeah. Right. So <laughs> yeah. my my meta ethics take after too many too many years reading meta ethics is moral realism is true. Uh, moral moral truths are objective, stance independent, and knowable for us, and that's why how we make social progress. On the other hand, I used to think that what I was doing was trying to salvage the idea of moral responsibility. What I've realized in the past two weeks is that I'm really just trying to kill it safely. <laughs> um, I'm trying to, to euthanize it in a way that doesn't cause substantial harm to lots of people. And the process involves, you know, so, so the pedagogical approach that I'm, I'm using, broadly speaking, takes the form of reduce people's belief in free will by increasing their recognition of the ubiquity of luck while avoiding the slide into fatalism and nihilism, which is a genuine psychological concern here, not to be taken lightly. So that's, that's I think, basically sort of the long and short of... Um, and, and so let me just add one thing. In, in psychology, and especially psychology as applied in education, 
one of the major theories that I'm I'm harassing in this paper is um, what's called attribution theory, which, um, as Gil was saying, is sort of this idea of individuals make causal attributions based on events. They explain how an event happened. They assign causal responsibility. How they attribute things impacts future behavior uh, in various kinds of ways. There's a bunch of psychological research on this. But what I essentially argue is that the literature in attribution uses the word luck wrong in a way that is really problematic and, and should raise a lot of doubts about a lot of the claims. And most importantly, about the bottom line conclusion of attribution theory, which is we should emphasize hard work and de-emphasize the role of luck in people's experiences if we want them to make better, you know, to do better in the future, essentially, right? And there is the connection to things like meritocracy. What you find, in my opinion, is Protestant work ethic and stuff gets reproduced as attribution theory, which then gets turned into an education system that supports a meritocracy that promotes this noble lie that hard work actually does outweigh luck in this way. C can I just ask a really, a really broad general question as we get mm -hmm. into this, which is like, how do you see, how do you conceive of the effort to preserve moral norms despite the claims you want to make against the possession of free will and, and, and the whole like way that we attribute responsibility on the basis of the supposition of free will? Mm -hmm. Like what, what, what is the strategy, what's the general strategy for preventing that slide into nihilism? Yeah, absolutely. So from the meta, meta ethics argument side of this, the solution is first and foremost to just separate, to help people understand that there's a separation between moral claims being true and us having the access to them and the motivation to act on them. Those are, those are th actually really three questions, right, mm -hmm. let's say, right? The first one, whether moral claims are objectively true or not, the, the moral realist position itself, is untouched by my position, in my opinion, because moral truths are just truths about things like you ought not to cause unnecessary suffering. And it continues to be wrong to cause unnecessary suffering, whether or not, you know, free will exists, in my opinion. So this, some might worry about like the ought implies can concern. My understanding is actually, I think what we, we mean when we say ought implies can is that moral responsibility implies can, not the moral truths themselves. So what, what we are saying is if we're going to hold someone morally responsible, they have to have had control. So it's essentially a statement of the control condition, which is something that Nagel puts forward that causes all of the problem here, which is we all intuitively believe it's wrong to ho hold someone responsible for things that are beyond their control. So, so we separate these things out, right? So the moral truths are objectively true whether or not we have free will. The question is, if we disabuse people of the belief in free will and moral responsibility, as I've just said, right, will they still act morally? And I think they will. I think there's good reason to think if you do this, this, this teaching properly, you can help people understand for, for the basic reason, if nothing else, then like, I don't think that any of y'all act morally because you think you have free will. I think your motivation for acting morally is that you value acting morally or you value the social consequences of acting morally. One or, like one or the other, right? Hopefully it's the first one, but at least <laughs> we, we, we'll, we'll take either. The second one does right? a lot of work too. Let's yeah, we'll be honest. take the but, instrumental yeah. if, we, if we need to, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. At the end of the day, right, we're talking pragmatics here. Um, and what I'm saying is you can very easily motivate people through – a properly orchestrated criminal justice system plus a proper moral education. Like most of the work is in the moral education side. If you just teach young people ethics better, they don't need to believe in this fairy tale about free will. It's, it's essentially the same reason that like secular ethicists will say, I don't need to teach people about God or a soul or something to make them believe that they should act ethically. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the major approach to avoiding the slide. So that we maintain the moral norms and the motivation for them and uh, like a whole separate discussion about the access to them. But I don't think that's super important for right now. And, and at the same time, time, what I think we, we are able to get out of this is moral truths are real. Moral responsibility in the sense that we know it is not 
but people still will and in a weird way should, should. act morally. <laughs> yeah, they should act morally. <laughs> even if we're not going to assign moral responsibility when they fail to do so. Wow, this is this does really feel so much like Yo Spinoza's entered the chat, and this feels like a really big L for my boy Sart. But let me see how big of an L it is, though. I'm gonna I'm gonna be I'm gonna be honest with you. Sart is a cope, and Spinoza is right. <laughs> oh shit! Okay, okay. I um, love this kind of clarity. Like let's let's hear the gambit. Yeah, I I I've got to say I'm I'm out. Like y'all take over. Oh, I'm sorry, Will. Like, we, this, we can still hang out in a brutal. utopia together, Will. I, I believe that we can we can find a place together. You're a low-key Sartrean and a crypto Kantian. So what do you have to say about yeah, that? Yeah, so like yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm losing everything here, but I'm I'm gonna try <laughs> to stick with it because there there is something that uh I was I was genuinely uh unsure about, and this isn't me about to attack you, but a little bit. Please maybe. attack please attack me. I need to be attacked right okay, now. Okay, <laughs> so I guess I want to understand what you mean by free will and luck. So when you say determinist, mm -hmm. I imagine someone listening might think so is Aaron saying I make no choices at all that you know actually it's you know it's all the way down as if like the cake has already been baked or is he saying something like even when I make choices even when I make moral choices I do not have control over the effects of those choices given that you know I am acting in the social space in which other people are acting over whom I have no control and I don't have all the information about how that choice will reverberate you know once mm -hmm. it makes contact with social structures and the environment mm -hmm. because I can see you know I'm going to be honest with you I, I lose what the point of the moral pedagogy is if your position is actually there are no choices being made because it seems like you know whether we we believe or not, yeah. you know, we're going to do whatever we're mm -hmm. going to do. Now, mm -hmm. if you're saying something along the lines of the luck part is once my uh, my action goes from thought to something I try to attempt, mm -hmm. then I, I'm starting to see like, yeah, um, free will can be a cope because the cope is I can be the full determinant of the meaning of my actions and the effect of my actions. So, mm -hmm. you know, it could just clear clear up for me if you're saying, you know, Absolutely. by determinism, are you saying, you know, we do not make choices. Um, the universe has already been set in motion. That's it. Or is it, you know, the problem is the luck is I make choices and this is where my boy Sartre comes back in. They add the consequences of my actions are returned to me in a, in a quite disfigured state, what he calls counter finality. Yeah. So this is, this is a really great question. And I do think this. so it's essential to what what is called the control account of luck or the lack of control account. I think it's just to just call it the control account of luck, right? What do we mean when we say luck is defined as a lack of control? What does the word control there mean? And I think I haven't seen anywhere in the luck literature anyone making the distinction that I make here, but I think there's a crucial ambiguity in the word luck or in the word control that needs to be resolved here. Um, and what I do is I, I think you see a version of this in the free will side of things. So if we could talk about the free will stuff, we can, we can bring that in. But basically I think we need to make a distinction between what we call, um, what I call um, causal efficacy or causal influence and robust control. OK, so by robust control, what I mean is the latter sort of thing that you are getting into there where you have what I, what I call causal domination, which is you are the determining causal factor at every stage in the chain of causes leading up to the thing that we're describing. Right. That to me is robust control. And as everyone I think will probably recognize is impossible, right? Does not exist, but is important, right? Because I think that robust control is actually what we need if we want to have a solid foundation for claims about free will, moral responsibility, an independent sense of self, all those sorts of things. Because causal influence itself clearly can't ground that, right? Like we can clearly make sense of the idea that people have – the ability to pick up a, you know, a, a phone or something like that, but that that ability to, you know, act when forced to do so is not the same thing as having the kind of control of oneself, the robust control that seems necessary for us to say you are now responsible for your actions. So with that distinction in mind, what I will say is causal influence is commonplace, right? Everyday experience. 
robust control doesn't exist, and that's a big problem for belief in free will and moral responsibility. That's how I split that that distinction apart. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, and you know, listening to you talk, I you know, and I, I see that maybe this is where the project is coming from. That in many ways, the the doxa, the com, or at least the common sense way of talking, is lean towards the idea of um, what was language used, causal dominance. You know, mm-hmm. and so you know, when we talk about moral responsibility, even though some people say there's systemic disadvantage or something, um, the way our systems often operate are as if. We describe that there are situations of, of bad luck or good luck, but mm-hmm, the agent mm-hmm. is still someone for whom they must be able to be responsible for at least you know, a very far term of the effects of their actions. And you're trying to question that if you lose causal dominance, you actually have a hard time getting back to moral responsibility, at least the way that we talk about it. But that's mm-hmm. not the same as saying that no choices are ever made and that from the Big Bang you know, this was what it was always going to be. And I mean, like, there is sort of a sense in which I I do agree that, like, things are determined. But what I would say is, you know, you are also a malleable entity and can be influenced by things, including my arguments, that can then determine you to act differently. So the reason we don't slip into nihilism is because by thinking through these things, by talking about them, by arguing about them, and then by acting differently based on that knowledge we are still, we can still improve the world, right? We can still make, do ethical things in this kind of way. It's just, we just have to acknowledge whether we do those things and are successful is a matter of luck. It just is ultimately a matter of luck. And let me, let me add one more concept in here because we didn't, we didn't fully lay out the Nagel side of things, but I want to just highlight the most problematic kind of luck. The one on which all of this really hinges is constitutive luck. The luck of the features that make you who you are. That's where the regress problem really gets bad. You know, as you as you pointed out, like consequential luck, circumstantial luck, the arguments against those being a problem is always to shift the focus of morality inward towards the individual mm. and their own actions as Sartre, uh, unfortunately, I think it tries to do in a sense, right? And... I think that's, you know, and and what happens is you run into a wall of constitutive luck where you just can't deny that your constitution is the result of things beyond your control in any sense, not even just like Mm -hmm. the the robust sense, but like in the thin causal efficacy sense, like uh, one, one pedagogical activity that I like to do to help people acknowledge this reality is just ask them to name some action they've done in their lives that they believe was genuinely under their control and then just do a regress game with them of asking why did you do that thing what was your reason why was that reason effective what features of you made that reason effective did you choose those features and then you just repeat that process until you get far enough back in their lives that they have to acknowledge that they didn't have control i i know that you're more at the moment like steeped in psychological literature but a part of the, the philosopher in me wants to ask, where what is your point of distinction from Kant? Because mm. Kant also believes, you know, has a whole theory of transcendental illusion, right? Necessary mm-hmm. illusions. And that it's actually not possible to act if you don't like have some belief, for example, that your actions can have efficacy in the world. That like, you know, it's mm-hmm. very important for him in his what I think is the, the apex of the history moment of the history of philosophy. Kant's attempt to to refute Spinoza in the teleology section of the Critique of Judgment, where mm-hmm. he says, like, first of all, he, he, he's obsessed with the fact that, like, somehow Spinoza was a good person. I've talked about this before. Somehow Spinoza was so morally noble, but without mm-hmm. any of the metaphysical justifications for that moral nobility. Like, Spinoza <laughs> made, you know what I mean? Like, Spinoza made an yeah. argument that the world is just, like, it's a determinist argument. Kant's like, psychology, Kant's motivational psychology is so funny. <laughs> so where, 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 How can where, you be where, doing this if you haven't studied yeah, meta? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But so I guess like my question is like, where, where do you like, I, I think this is, I think this is Kant's essential problem in all of his mm-hmm. work. Uh, regulative ideas are cope in a certain way, right? Like they're an attempt to explain how like, despite the fact that we can't prove any of these things that we really need to prove, that we should still act in a certain, we should act as if these things were true, right? We should act as if right. there was a God. We should act as if... You know, there is teleology in, in, in nature. Like we should act as if, so what, what is, I guess like, mm-hmm. what, where's your, where's your point of distinction? Maybe this is too philosophically pedantic, but I am right. curious, like, because no, I think I, this I, is a problem yeah. that Kant just desperately struggled with 
And I'm curious, like, where, what, what you see that is different about what you want to propose than just, like, accepting the as-if structure of, of moral norms. Yeah, I really like this question. And I want to be clear, I, you know, I've read a fair bit of Kant while teaching ethics and whatnots, but I am not by any means a Kantian scholar. Um, I don't feel like I, I know exactly all of the, the ins and outs of it. And I also want to say, I think it's, it's worth pointing out that Nagel kind of does Kant mm -hmm. a little dirty in the paper that I had you all does. read. Yeah, I, I think okay. it's, I think we can all, and like there's been subsequent work. Um, there's a really good recent book that just came out in 2020 in the like, uh, what is it, Rutledge or whatever the thing, um, uh, Handbook of Philosophy and Psychology of Luck. Um, there's a good chapter in there about how like, hey, Kant actually takes luck into account to some extent and things like that. To, to your question, how is my view sort of different from what, what I think you're still the describing there to yeah. me? Yeah, yeah that, that, that to me is kind of a, akin to a noble lie approach, mm. right? It's one version of the noble lie approach where you're sort of saying, look, we all know this isn't real, but let's all act as if it kind of is. Mm -hmm. I'm very robustly saying, look, let's not all act <laughs> as if this is real. Let's very oh, okay. clearly all sit yeah. in the room with the fact that this is not real and, you know, go through the existential crisis about our pr pride and our ego and our, you know, sense of independent self and all that stuff. And then when we come out the other side, let's act really differently than we've been acting for the past hundreds of years because we believe <laughs> in these copes mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. because i think these copes are deeply deeply harmful right. and and like the the justifications for them fall apart psychologically and philosophically and on the other side of all of that is the utopia that will wants to live in um <laughs> like i think i think we can, okay. i'm back i'm back baby yeah, <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> I, think, all right. I, I really do genuinely believe like, I, look, I'll say, you know, there's always a part of me that's fatalistic and says nothing will change. But, like, I do genuinely think changing people's ideas about belief in free will, not just telling them pretend that it's real when it isn't, but instead tell them it's it's not and you need to have compassion for everyone, which is a very hard job and you need to like let go of your desire to punish and judge and do a lot of things that are really psychologically difficult but on the other side is a better place i think personally and socially that's a really good answer to that question and i think it brings you closer to spinoza actually for whom yeah like the part of the problem is precisely our prejudices and preconceptions about being free you know, voluntaristically mm -hmm. free agents. And his problem with that is twofold. On the one hand, theoretically, he thinks it doesn't hold up under scrutiny, but I think he's more interested in the practical problem of like, that's actually a kind of harmful thing to think. And like the ways in which we go about interacting with one another on the basis of these, these ideas is psychologically and socially damaging. Right. And it does lead mm -hmm. to things like, like, you know, again, you know, the, the, a punitive, a punitive society where like someone does something that we think is wrong. We can all agree that's wrong. Doesn't make it right to put them in a cage actually. And you would only do that if you buy into a robust voluntaristic notion that says, well, they could have chosen to do otherwise because they have something mm -hmm. called free will spontaneously and they just chose to be a bad person. So let's punish them for mm -hmm. it. Right. And so the question is something like, yeah, what is a spinazist uh, or, you know, determinist pedagogy look like one that's invested yeah. in a project of social improvement or progress or justice where we're trying to leave behind these ideas that, you know, maybe are getting in the way of us being able to like relate to one another in a more compassionate or human way. Well, and I'll just say, you know, really it was reading the Nagel paper that like was the experience that pushed me in this direction, but other lucky experiences were, um, when I was at UVEA, I was in the philosophy honors, which got I got to do like special one on one seminars with professors in, in you know each different area of philosophy. And in the meta ethics, I was very lucky to get Jim Cargyle, which I'm not sure if anybody still recognizes that name, but like a, a dominant Platonist genius in so many ways. And he walked me through Spinoza's ethics, and I vibed so hard with it, <laughs> as, as hard as one could with something that was attempting to be written as geometry, um, but like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really, I, I am very much sympathetic to that worldview, I think. And I, I really find a lot of value there. Um, I wanted to ask, I guess, switch gears and ask more about what you think the stakes of your view are. So I, I take it that there's this desire to critique the idea of meritocracy 
And I think there's a kind of obvious way in which that has political stakes in terms of how we perceive others as being responsible for their fate. And just in within the realm of like moralistic, like political discourse that is actually just a form of moralism, I, it seems mm-hmm. to offer a, a corrective to that. Like mm-hmm. my, my question is that, so like when I think about that world of debate, which is sort of um, like a scaled up kind of moralism as politics. I, I find myself being sympathetic to what you're saying as a kind of internal critique of that discourse. Um, mm-hmm. But then I also find myself wondering like what the relationship is between a sort of moral conversation about free will and political freedom. Because like, I don't usually think it's just my own, my like, internal register like my instincts Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. i don't usually think that this that the conversation conversation is about political freedom in a sense so for instance i i would say that the political stakes like if i were to say here's something that sounds compatible with what you're saying the -hmm. closest thing i can think of in the world of like normative political philosophy would be like luck egalitarianism Mm mm-hmm mm-hmm where like the reason you can't talk about equality of opportunity and merit and based on differential talents and so on is that you can't eliminate the fact of of luck and therefore mm-hmm. the only moral obligation that should hold in a society is strict egalitarianism um so that mm-hmm. that seems like a consequence But that's not a conversation about freedom. Like when I think about freedom, political freedom, I think about a kind of freedom that is already determined by social conditions and constituted by social relations. So whether or not people have free will in that context, I'm never sure how to like scale up the conversation to actually be about political freedom. And I think that that might be a source of like disconnect between like Spinoza and Sartre, I think Sartre is talking about trying to talk about political freedom, um, mm-hmm. however successfully. Um, so I'm wondering if you just have any any thoughts about how to like connect the discourses, or maybe you don't agree that this is like an internal critique of a moral a kind of moralism, or just how you would sit yourself situate what you're talking about in relationship to like a kind of broader political mm-hmm. project. No, that's that's a really, really great question. And I want to, there's a, like five threads in there that I want to pull on and let me try to do them in a functional order. Um, first of all, let me say, um, I'm still working through a lot of the like policy implications. So I, I basically think everything that I said up to the po- up to this point is inarguable. I'm not entirely sure what the actual policy implications are of this view beyond like low hanging fruit, like you're getting rid of punitive justice. Like that's clearly just out the window. But so let me let me address some of the things in there. First of all, the luck egalitarianism part. I'm not an expert on luck egalitarianism. I'm going to work on being one soon. Um, but for the moment, what I understand of it is at least that I'm probably not going in the luck egalitarianism direction because at least for the majority of luck egalitarians, as I understand it, they kind of want to co-opt and preserve the intuition of choice and responsibility. They just want to create an environment in which luck is not the dominant factor in people's outcomes and that choice then becomes the dominant factor. I'm sympathetic to, as far as I understand, I haven't gotten to read it yet. I think Anderson has a particular critique where it's essentially like egalitarianism fails because free will doesn't exist because the social factors continue to reproduce um, inequality because there's really no like creation of an equality of opportunity starting point that doesn't then immediately become corrupted in various kinds of ways. All, all sorts of those kinds of arguments make me sympathetic to thinking that like, I'm probably not going to want to be leading people in the luck egalitarianism direction. Um, so what, what direction then am I leading people in? That gets a little trickier probably. I do want to, I think your question about political freedom though is also really interesting. And then maybe we can talk about other policy stuff. I don't know, I haven't done the reading enough on political freedom as a, as a concept in distinction here, but the way you were talking about it there, I, I wonder if maybe this is another example where the causal influence, robust control distinction 
can help us, can help us stop talking past each other. Because what it sounds like when you're talking about political freedom, or maybe what people are sometimes talking about when they talk about like political agency or autonomy is more in the causal influence camp, I think. You're talking about, you know, can I bring about political change? Can I vote? Um, and like, yes, you can pull the lever. Yes, you can do that thing. Who you vote for is going to be beyond, you know, the result of factors beyond your control. But you do have, you know, we can we can make a distinction, for example, between somebody who has causal influence over who they get to vote for and somebody who doesn't because they live in an authoritarian dictatorship. And I think we can make very easy moral arguments about why we prefer the first over the second, right? And none of it requires appeals to robust control or free will. So we can still maintain political freedom is real, is good, it should be promoted, but has nothing to do with free will or robust control. And that, you know, that has then separate implications for politics and policy, I think. Does that does that sort of get at some of your concerns there? Yeah, I think so. I wasn't really mm -hmm. thinking about policy. I guess that's not like the language I use for what I'm talking about. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I see what you what I see what you mean. Um, yeah, I, I guess like I guess I'm just never sure how like there's either one of two ways that I'm either like kind of with it or I'm not with it with what you're saying. Like it might sound that like you're engaging in a moralism that becomes anti-moralism. Like we just can't have a right. moralism. Right. And then, and then I don't really think I have so much of a question because then the conversation about political freedom is just like, you know, kind of on mm -hmm. some other shit basically. Um, and you could maybe just drop the concern with free will and that's fine. Can I ask for a clarification here actually? This, so Maybe it's just because I, I come from the ethics background and I only have this one giant hammer that I use on everything. Um, but like, I probably am just saying we can, we should, I think we should still continue to do politics as morality at scale. We should just have better morality and our better morality comes from this recognition that we don't have free will. I, I don't think that mm. like, pol that politics is absent of the moral concerns of you know, uh, reducing suffering. I think that's what's driving politics in my mind, which, you know, maybe just means that I'm an ethicist, not a political theorist, but like, that's where I come from. So to answer your question, I, I don't want to move towards an anti-moralizing state. I want to move towards a, a what I think of as a better moralizing state. Yeah, but then I'm like unsure of how to cash some of these checks in practice. Sure. You know, I mean, it's as, so you want like, yeah, I just kind of want to hear you try to help me think through this more carefully because you want a moral realism. You even want like a moral, a moralizing sort of approach that's willing to say like X is right, X is wrong, right? Like in strong objective terms without moral responsibility. And I'm just, again, like not totally sure how to think these things in some way, like part of the problem, I think that you're trying to get us to recognize, to name properly in, in order hopefully to be able to overcome it is that mm -hmm. like the conception that we have of moral responsibility that accords with all of our sort of standard everyday intuitions about culpability as an individual characterization uh, is not helpful or viable. Mm -hmm. But again, then I'm not sure how, yeah, like what do we actually do? Like how do we enact a moral uh, realism without yeah. moral responsibility? Yeah, so let's let's take the easy case for my view, and then we can try to. There are hard cases we can go towards, um, but the easy case that I think we've talked about here is the sort of reform of our criminal justice system, right? So you know, America's criminal justice system is currently a, a horrible mess of, you know, nominally rehabilitative, while primarily it feels like punitive and deterrent. And when we're talking about the different justifications here, right? So. What would the approach then be under my model? It would be we would, you know, clearly get rid of the punitive side of things. The goal is no longer to punish anyone. And like I, 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 I am it is hard to come down on this, but I do think that this is where we have to end up. Nobody deserves to be punished. <laughs> and that's a hard place to get to, I think. Um Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not I'm not here to tell victims or survivors of anything that like they shouldn't still have their emotional reactions. That is not the view at all. Right. But I do think philosophically, ethically speaking, nobody deserves to be punished. So why are we punishing people? We're either punishing them because it 
makes the world better. We're doing it because it makes the world better, right? Like the only reason to do it is to, for some other ethical trade-off like reducing suffering or, you know, promoting flourishing or something. Um, so, Or at least that's then, what we tell ourselves, right? Right. Hopefully. Right. Like, 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 and that, that, that should be our goal, whether or not that's actually what we're doing. Right. Yeah. That's, that's the goal of our new justice system. And there you get, you know, hopefully, a, you know, a rehabilitative, restorative kind of model that I, I think you've seen evidence of success for that in other countries. Um, and it's not, I don't think it has the kind of paternalism that I think some folks worry about with this view where, when you start to talk about how nobody has free will, it's like, oh, well, you're just going to shuffle people around the board like chips. Like we're all just objects to move around at this point. But I think there's a good know, you know, argument. <laughs> right, right. I mean, I'm hey, also just an object. I've always If you want to consent to being an object that gets moved around, I'm, I'm perfectly on board with that. Um, I just think that like, you know. But you I shouldn't must think... consent, so. Right. Yeah. And. I think that it still makes sense to talk about things like consent and respecting agency and respecting autonomy in the not robust control kind of sense. And that society should be aiming to create spaces where our consent is driven by the right kinds of forces. And by that, I mean non-exploitative, non-immoral forces, right? Yeah, so let me let me jump in, because I actually what you said there, it kind of, you know, clicked in my mind how you can still have, you know, be, you know and I actually see why you want to hold to your, your moral real, realism so it's not just a free-for-all. You right. know, what you're trying to say is on this view, you know, we can still have notions of agency and consent, but, you know, we don't necessarily need to freight that with the baggage of... Uh, of, of, of causal dominance. One mm -hmm. can say that there's an, uh, an, an objective um, necessity or right to respect agency and consent, not insofar as the agent's able to completely control um, their actions or their activities, but by virtue of being an agent. You know, so irrespective mm -hmm. of, you know, the idea that they can control all the effects of their actions. And so mm -hmm. you can sever that. And, you know, when Gil was talking, I was thinking, well, one way you could cast a check is, so what you're talking about is a, a type of, you know, moral ordering of the world in which we acknowledge the necessity of luck, but it still gives us the outlines of how you would want to arrange this world such that the abrogation of the certain moral truths is less and less likely. And, mm -hmm. you know, even when it happens, we would be developing institutions and infrastructures to um, handle the, those issues when agency is, is crossed or when people, you know, do things that, um, you know, cross the, mm -hmm. the, the moral realism. Mm -hmm. And so what you were thinking about here, I, I, I wonder, is, you know, the moral realism insofar as, you know, we do live in a world with institutions and all of that, and these institutions do have effects. It would give us some guidelines of what we'd like, how we'd like our institutions to be oriented and designed but you know also as i'm listening to you you know it, i just find myself thinking you know you might be even more of a utopian than i am the type of you know um world outcome you're talking Get about like you know, it's, it's not like, wrong. Like, and, 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 and I, I don't, I don't even just, mean that as a dump. Yeah, it's no, just like just you know, it you know I don't, wrong. I don't meet many of them mm -hmm. out there. You know, at least the ones that I, I respect. <laughs> um, uh -huh. You know, the type of your know, ordering of the world and our intuitions you're talking about, you know, would require such a radically different set of social institutions that we have now. We've been focusing on on the justice system, but you know, even as you're talking, I realize you're, we're doing ethics, not politics. I'm also also kind of like maybe this is because I can't let go of that transcendental illusion but there mm -hmm. are those with a great deal of power in my society that I do want to say you are responsible when I think about you know mm -hmm. um, you know mm -hmm. those who are wealthy when I think about those you think about who a boardroom of Goldman of, Sachs it's there's utility in being able yeah. to say these people are wrong Mm, okay. Yeah, yeah, uh, oh, yeah. Owen, oh, oh, God. And so, like, you know, you know, and let me just like say yeah. this real quick. So maybe you're saying, but you know, this is what's so challenging about this view. You need to be a willing to let go of that jouissance of saying the boardroom of Goldman Sachs is wrong, and keep your eye on the ball of what is the world we're trying to build. And so, even if the Goldman Sachs boardroom is wrong, that doesn't tell us what type of world we'd like to see. 
Yeah. Though I, I really do like saying the Goldman Sachs boardroom is wrong, though. It just feels so yeah, damn good. It, it feels good. But I just don't understand. Like, if there's more, if there are moral facts and they are doing things that are contrary to moral facts, then aren't they wrong? Yeah, they're acting oh, wrongly. Okay. Right. They are yeah, absolutely just, acting I'm, wrongly. Yeah, but they don't have guess, moral responsibility. I just want to be like, I right. guess I just don't really understand. I'm sorry mm -hmm. to keep coming back to the the stakes. It's like sometimes. I'm I'm just not a moral philosopher. I think anyone who's spent any time talking to me will realize that I just like it's not my milieu. The better so for you, I think. I, I find my I I feel like I'm like a, a in freshman ethics class every time I have a conversation like this. So like if moral respond like what is the problem exactly with moral responsibility? It's just that we have a bad attitude toward it. Like yeah, like can't you have just like a nicely contextual like idea of moral responsibility, you know, like in the Marxist tradition, there's like, you know, a whole conversation about the way that value is um, relative to social form, which is like, you know, so you're, you're re responsible, probably relative to your capacities and the system. And the only way in which res it responsibility would be like false and not real is in respect to an objective moral realism, but like for other practical purposes, it might be perfectly useful. So I just, I'm not really sure what's at stake in getting rid of responsibility, except for in the really narrow moralistic sense in which liberal discourse talks about punishing people and stuff. I mean, maybe, right. maybe, maybe one place to, if I could just add to that, to this question, one place to work <laughs> some of this out. Okay, I got a list going. So yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah is, the, it's a pedagogical focus that your that your paper has, right? It's about how we talk about these things and the importance of the ways that we talk about them. And so I guess I'm wondering, like, so it sounds to me, I can see where, like, the voluntarist illusion is a problem in certain ethical domains, namely, like, punitive power. There are other instances in which you admit that it's it would be really hard for us to give up the voluntarist illusion with things like consent, and so like there, it actually, that illusion is actually quite important. Um, and I think it's internal to the concept of consent. Like, I don't know that you can have a concept of consent that doesn't have a voluntarist illusion, let's say, or an element of voluntarism built in. I guess my question is like, like how, because it's a pedagogical focus, the per, like how, what, what is the pedagogical strategy for parsing where this illusion is bad, where it's yeah. good? Do you, do you know what I mean? Like that, I guess yeah. that's my, that's my, that's my, I guess, like deeper moral concern. Okay. Wait, can I also just jump in? <laughs> I, 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 I know. I hate it when we do this, when we have guests on, it's, but it's just it, no, like, yeah. no, it's okay. It is I, your show. Uh, so I, I actually, no. I'll just say this real quick thing. Yeah. But I actually thought that your view was, say, with consent, it's not that choices aren't made. We're talking about, you know, causal dominance. So we wouldn't lose what Owen was rightly saying. We don't want to lose at least the aspect of voluntarism uh, that is internal to consent is that people make choices and the, their ability to make choices should be respected. And that the, what follows from this view isn't the, the idea that because we don't have moral responsibility, we should be able to try to control what other people do do that would you know that would still be you know a violation of the moral norms of consent so i just want to like jump in and say you're not saying that you know, helpful, actually, we don't yeah. have the capacity yeah. to make choices that would be internal to consent but what isn't necessarily internal is that i can completely control the effects of my actions you know so that's what the way that i was coming at that you can still have that without yeah. the the moral responsibility that goes with causal dominance yeah. Okay. So let me see if I can answer all three of you at once here, because I think I can do it. I think I got the notes here. I think you can. Um, Let's go. And, and actually, I'm going to start by admitting to Will that I am even more utopian than he realizes, because not only am I a moral realist, I'm a I'm a, like a pretty thoroughgoing pluralist about it. I <laughs> I want I want all the intuitions in my bag. Like I want I want the you know the wow. autonomy <laughs> intuitions. I want the flourishing intuitions. Mm. I want the reducing suffering intuitions. I want the care ethics intuitions. I want it all. So yeah, like I, I it's it. all wow. in my in my world. But and while King, acknowledging their King. illusory character, okay. that's the challenge. <laughs> like. but, but while yeah okay so. First of all, I just want you to, I want everyone to understand how greedy I am ontologically here. Um, yeah. 
Then Ontological just, greed. We love it. Let's go. Right. Yeah, let me yeah. just go in order through the concerns here. So, so responsibility towards you know, and Goldman Sachs folks, right? I think the answer is you. Yeah, you really got to acknowledge that they aren't more robustly in control of their actions than the people that they are screwing over. And I think if you read, um, you know, Meritocracy Trap or something like that, that's the exact argument that he makes, which is everyone involved in meritocracy is suffering and they are doing it because of forces beyond their control and they can't get out of it. And so the elites at Goldman Sachs, yeah, they're screwing everybody over, but they're also working 70 hours a week and have alcoholism and are miserable and have, you know, all this money but can't actually enjoy it kind of situation. And they are, they're also feeling precarious all the time, just like everybody else. So like at the end of the day, I really am here to try to engender universal compassion for everybody trapped in samsara, not just some of the people trapped in samsara. Um, so let me, let me, I'll just keep going though. And then everybody can, can Please, tell me yeah. why I'm wrong. Oh um, so, so from here we go into, to, um, Lillian's point about con the contextual idea of moral responsibility. Why can't we salvage this? And maybe, you know, sometime in the distant future, our ancestors can. But right now we can't. Like right now, it seems to me that the concept of moral responsibility psychologically is so heavily bound up with all of the bad stuff that I've been talking about here. And um, trying to replace it with something else, I don't, I don't see the value in trying to preserve it. Instead, I think there's a value in emphasizing causal influence. Because what I think is at the end of the day, moral responsibility, you know, wants to piggyback on causal influence, but it doesn't actually, I think, add anything to our conversation about causal influence. I think we can get everything we need by just saying this thing was, this thing that happened was wrong. This event was bad and should not have happened. How do we prevent future such events, what are the causal influences, if they're internal to the individual, quote unquote, right, internal and external are a weird concept once you start getting into all of this, but like, you know, quote unquote, the internal features of them, then we work on mechanisms that address the internal features. If it's external, we work on addressing the external features. At no point do we need to point at any piece of the causal chain and say, you there, you're, you know, you're bad because you did this thing, which is essentially, I think, what moral responsibility is the only thing that moral responsibility is actually good for. That's what it's for, yeah. Right. And so then um, finally, I guess the the consent and illusion of free will, as Will was saying there, I don't think a, a real genuine understanding of consent has has very little to do with the problem of free will here. So let me put it this way. Right. When we value consent, what I think we're actually valuing is that the person's behavior is not radically free, but that it's motivated, it's caused by the right kinds of forces. And this is where it gets into the like Dennett idea of free will, which I think is a good idea. It's just not a free will that can preserve moral responsibility. But it is some it is right to say, for example, that like I want, you know, will to want to make out with me, not because he's yeah, concerned fair. about his but not because you're worried about your job but because I'm just really un, you know, compellingly attractive to you and you are forced, <laughs> you are desperate to, to want to kiss this face, like that, getting, you don't have free I'm will. Right in my mind, like, oh my goodness. <laughs> right, what I'm saying is that like yeah, yeah, the yeah. sexiest sex there is is compelled. It's just compelled in the right way, mm -hmm. right? You, what you really want oh, to feel from someone yeah, is that fair, they are yeah. overwhelmingly compelled to want to be with you for no other reason than because of you being you. Right. Um, so that's my answer to the consent question. And then um, I'll just add two more quick things and maybe we can unpack these some. Uh, the reason I'm this utopian, uh, other than I, I have no other choice, obviously, obviously. Um, <laughs> is I do think there is psychological evidence that this is not as unobtainable as it might first appear. Um, I think there, the evidence in favor of the noble lie approach to free will that I've currently looked at is, I think, questionable and you know, again, I haven't done enough studies. I, I've only had a cult for a couple of years now. But anecdotally, my hit rate for getting people on board with this perspective is is above, you know, is above average mm -hmm. compared to other things I've tried to convince people about. I actually think if you package this the right way, it is a deeply compelling, enticing view and you can bring people over to it and their behavior does change. I, I feel like I know people who have been, had their, had their behavior influenced by it. And I feel like, 
again, I could be lying to myself on many, many levels, but I do think that I have internalized this view and it has changed how I interact with people. I don't get as angry, though I do still get angry. It's easier to do. So one of the the practical um, real world applications of this is, is mindfulness. Um, and I mentioned this, I think, a little bit in the paper. It needs more unpacking. But like, you know, a lot of mindfulness work is about acceptance and, you know, non-attachment and using those things as a psychological mechanism to alter your behavior so that you do not reproduce more suffering in the world. The concern there, of course, is you don't want to slip into, again, fatalism and nihilism. And that's why we have the other side of the equation that I've presented. But I do think that that kind of psychological work, there's evidence behind it. And it's it's a part of this process, right? And so the pedagogical strategies that I'm developing are various versions of the regress argument that I presented earlier, mindfulness work, philosophizing and getting people to be aware of their experiences. And I think that there's a lot of untapped potential there. Now, let me just like add anecdotally to your little anecdotal pile here that like when I encountered Spinoza and onboarded Spinoza's determinism, like it made me a more compassionate and forgiving person. It actually, like yeah. it measurably did. And there's some psych studies about this, that reducing reducing attributions. So this gets back to our friend, the attribution theory. There's evidence from attribution theory that if you attribute, um, there's something called the fundamental attribution error, um, which refers to all of our terrible psychological predilection to when we have a problem or do something wrong, it's caused by an external factor, <laughs> nice. good, yeah. right? Yeah, good. And when everybody else does something wrong, it's caused by an internal factor, nice. yeah, essentially, that's right? Great. This short circuits the problem in a sense, right? Because that that that's attribution helpful. is about saving face, is about maintaining a sense of your own ego and moral status or something like that. And when you kill all of this stuff off, you can move away from that. And I do think there's evidence insofar as you can get people to uh, ascribe responsibility to things that are beyond someone's control, it actually increases compassion, increases humility, reduces, you know, urges that uh, I think are antisocial, essentially. Yeah, and I just want to say I completely agree with that fundamental attribution era. And I know that's true for everybody else, but my enemies, in particular, <laughs> they are the exception. But, no, there is always an exception to Internally, a rule. I mean, yes. Kant says that. That's that's true. Um, but I just also wanted to say real quick, because, you know, we've been focusing a lot on the punitive stuff, but I also just wanted to say, you know, for our listeners, mm -hmm. it just seems to me something that you're saying is obviously right when I think about shame. You know, I think we've mm -hmm. all been either little kids or have been in embarrassing situations and you just go, you rake yourself over the coals I shouldn't have said that or the only example that's coming to my head right now is like you know, you're at school and your pants rip and the kids laugh at you and you internalize you know this like you know, this is something embarrassing about you but you know with on this view I also think that you know if we're talking about something like psychological health it would really mm -hmm. attenuate mm -hmm. really pathological forms of shame of internalizing you know even like social responsibility that doesn't meet the height of like breaking a law where we would want to say to young people you should not feel shame about that that you know embarrassing things happen and you mm -hmm. know and that is not indicative of you and you what's something that you are that is yeah. you know it was it's the luck of the draw i think that's especially salient i think we've only been heading further and further mm -hmm. into a shame oriented conception of public morality and so i, right. I just appreciate that in this in that context like what Retur you're doing returning to yeah. form man returning to the, the, <laughs> the greeks yeah. and now that's right. we need to now we need stoicism. I feel like this is uh, No, stoicism. no stoicism. No, no, stoicism no, is bad. I feel like, <laughs> I feel like, what do you got against stoicism? This is not a stoic view. <laughs> I read a popular like book about stoicism, which is about as close as I get to ethics. And I thought it was pretty like similar to this. The whole thing is like you can't uh, okay. control it. Yeah, let me, let me fix that yeah, yeah. too. Well, Spinoza, also an enthusiast of the stoic. So let's, you know. Not, a, okay. not a stoic, so, but not a stoic. Not a stoic, though. Let me, not a stoic. Yeah, let me, let me address all of these things because I love all of you. And this is also <laughs> wonderful to me. Um, so, so first, the shame thing. Um, and I have had a, uh, conversations with uh, Chris to Thomason, who on over on Embrace the Void, she's you know wonderful philosopher of shame. I I don't fully I don't have like a final conclusion about the role of negative emotions ultimately in this view. I think there is a plausible version of where I'm going that says negative emotions should just be done away with wholesale if they can be replaced with positive 
alternative motivating forces, right? Don't don't worry about feeling shame or guilt. Those aren't useful emotions. Instead, engender compassion, humility, the, the positive versions of things that I think can serve the same potential function. I'm not 100% committed to that view because I know Krista has some arguments about why the negative emotions might still have um, some values. So there may be a potential space for them, but I certainly am absolutely with you on the idea that this reduces pathological shame. Um, and specifically, I'm gonna like, I'm gonna make this about the culture wars here for a second. Um, you know, because one of the reoccurring examples that I give of luck in the paper is white privilege, partly because it contradicts psychological literature that luck can't be internal, stable, and controllable, where I think it can. Uh, it's also fun because I found a paper that is, so, is, is, you know, it doesn't say it's a critique, but I think you can recognize it as a critique of white, pri uh, white privilege lessons, essentially white privilege um, coursework, um, where they find that teaching liberals white privilege lessons reduces their compassion towards poor white individuals Amazing. because it increases their attribution, their internal attributions of causality nice. because yeah. they didn't that's take a, advantage work, of man. their that's, that's white privilege. Work. Well, and look, I, I actually am happy that I have this paper. I'm happy that someone did this paper because now I can you know, come to conservatives and I can say, look, part of the advantage of my approach is it doesn't do that kind of white privilege discourse. The goal of this discourse, and I'm not gonna leave white privilege out, but it's not something where we want you to feel guilty, nor are we going to tell liberals that it's an okay thing to then justify trashing white people. I, you know, like we're all gonna dunk on white people. There's no way to avoid it. They've earned it. I would have never. <laughs> right, right. I'm not, I'm not saying never dunk on white people because it's funny, amongst other things, right? And comedy is a high value. Um, but like, you know, we need to be teaching our liberals that ascriptions of white privilege do not then, in, you know, allow you to be terrible to people or attribute bad things or, you know, have less compassion towards them. Um, that is a, that's a really important lesson to be including in this kind of pedagogy, I think. So that's, that's an implication where even though I'm clearly pulling us as far as I can towards the woke social justice agenda, that agenda also needs to incorporate these, these facts more than it has. Oh, and sorry, one more thing. Stoicism. Stoicism is bad because <laughs> yeah. it, it, broadly speaking, it has a dichotomy of control. It makes a distinction between things that are under our control and things that aren't. It generally ties it around the internal external distinction. Different Stoics have different layers of views about that. But at the end of the day, I think that is, it is at best, I've said, a halfway house to my view, right? If it, if it takes you starting with Stoicism to get to my view, fine, but you need to understand eventually you got to go the rest of the way, I think. So the singular book about moral philosophy I've read in the past 10 years that mm -hmm. was about Stoicism is a reinterpretation of it that denies the dichotomy of control. So I'm just going to... Okay. Mm, I'm just going to slam you with that so that I say I know what I was talking about. To, to, yeah, to be <laughs> fair, so, there have been various attempts, as with all theories that are wrong, to try to reconcile it by, <laughs> the, you know, by, by, by resolving the problems that arise from its central claims. I have, I've, see, I've read several versions of attempts to revise the dichotomy of control, and I think at the end of the day they either don't work or they end up where I am. Those are the two I, yeah. options. I, I, th I think you could charitably Or maybe recover. you're just a revised stoicism, if you consider oh, or, or maybe I'm just, like, at the end of the day, it's know. possible. But, like, here's, you know, here's the thing. I think you thing. can charitably, though, like, give a Spinoza's reading of the problems for, of the Stoics, not in terms of control. I think that work mm -hmm. does a lot of, that word does a lot of work. Um, and you could say that, like, there's an important distinction to be made uh, between things that are subject to our power and things that are not subject to our power. And right. That, would, right. Yeah. that that causal influence distinction is still meaningful, is still valuable. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just I don't think we can ascribe moral responsibility on the basis. And if Stoics don't, Stoics don't, don't want to do that, that's great. And if Stoics just want us to focus on the internal because they believe we have more causal influence. But here's what, another thing I'll say about Stoicism. I think if you like – in order to make it be correct, I think you have to so thoroughly dilute all of the insights that initially motivated it. Things like the dichotomy of control and this idea that we should focus our efforts internally, which mm -hmm. I think is really central to 
stoicism is that like, you know, you can't control whether you win the game, you can control how you play the game, right? That to me is still very problematic because amongst other things, it focuses our energy away from systemic change. Um, you know, and, and Stoics can say we're also in favor of systemic change. But then again, I think you're diluting the position to, you know, to accommodate something that is problematic for the position instead of recognizing that external things are just as much sometimes, I, th I would say arguably just as much under our influence as internal things and are the place where we need to be focusing more of our energy. I have like one last question, which is that if I like embrace your void here and like go all the mm -hmm, way with mm -hmm. like determine hard strict determinism and try to buy into fully rejecting uh moral responsibility or attribution can i maintain my narcissistic self-love <laughs> oh shit <laughs> um, which is i have to be honest to the amour, very amour proper and the, the amour de soi you know I mean, here's what I'll say is you can try, I guess. I don't think you'll succeed because I think this will kill it. Right. Um, well, you know, well, you then, know. well then you're going to need to motivate the problem for me here, bud. Well, you, you, you actually, um, you bring up the void and you asked at the beginning what embrace the void means. Um, and it means a lot of different things. It's not, there's no one definition of embracing the void. Um, but at least one of the definitions comes out of Buddhism, specifically the, um, Mula Madhyamaka tradition from Nagarjuna, which is that enlightenment comes from acknowledging the emptiness of emptiness, the fact that there are no radically independent entities, there's only radically interconnected entities all the way down, right? So, he, you know, that that void being the void in which, you know, we, we thought that there was an independent self that was us, and the recognition that we are ultimately just forces pushing on other forces. And by embracing that, we are actually better off. That's that's one version of embracing the void. Thanks a lot. Well, uh, I think that's going to do it for us today. Uh, we'd like once again to thank Aaron Rabinowitz for joining us. Um, Aaron, would you like to tell our audience about where they can find you online, about anything you've got coming up or what you're working on? Yeah, absolutely. So you can find me on almost all the time at Twitter at ETV pod. Um, you can find my podcast on most places, Embrace the Void and Philosophers in Space. I have a monthly um, skeptic article column at the UK Skeptic Mag uh, run by Merseyside Skeptic. That's a wonderful organization. I always want to promote them and their podcast Skeptics with the K is also quite excellent. You can so you can find me there as well. Come join the Philosophers in Space Facebook group. It's a really wonderful value centered community um i think that's that's probably all the oh and i'm gonna be if you're if you're in atlanta um i'm gonna be giving a talk at the american atheist convention in two weeks easter sunday easter easter weekend um and that's gonna be about uh secular community organizing that is you know social justice and values and rejects immoral non-believer stereotypes so i guess that's that's pretty much all of it Thank you so much. That was so wonderful to have you on. Thank you all so much. I had the, I had the most fun. You all had the best questions. I really had a great time. Cool. Well, new episodes of What's Left of Philosophy come out every two weeks, wherever you get your podcasts. Also, check us out on YouTube for videos and live streams. Before closing out today, we'd like to take a minute to thank some of the people who are supporting the show on Patreon. We couldn't do this without you, and we're really grateful. Today's new patrons are Connor Runnels, Mary-Kate Dugan, Jess Charlton, John Warren, Jake Reeder, Kate Murray, Omid Bagerli, Philip, uh, Miles Van Wormer, John Doe, Giacomo Giannini, Matt Farish, Ari Kirki, Matt, Osamu Miyame, Lint Axe, Jeremy Suman, Coleman, Owen Lawson, and Shannon Carter. Thank you all very much. If you too like what we're doing and want to support the show, please subscribe to our Patreon at patreon.com slash left of philosophy. Patrons get access to exclusive content like locked episodes and bonus videos. Follow us on Twitter at left of Phil, and don't forget to leave us good reviews and comments on your podcast app. With that, thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Take care, everyone. Sorry again about the voice.